Good evening and welcome to the Earthing and Bonding webinar brought to you this evening by NAPIT Trade Association. I'm Charlotte Lee, Head of Affairs at NAPIT and tonight I'm joined by Paul Markham who's our Senior Lecturer and um, Training Lecturer and uh, Dave Scully who's the Regional Inspections Manager for the North. There'll be time for some questions at the end of the presentation um, so if you could please use the questions um, section in the panel to the right hand side of your screen and type your questions in there. I'll be making notes of them throughout and we'll ask them to Dave and Paul at the end of, um, at the end of their presentation. Um, and you'll also find a copy of the presentation um, in the handout section which is in the right hand side um, in the panel on the right hand side of your screen. Along with the um, presentation, there's also a webinar certificate which um, you can save and print and download and keep for your records to show that you've attended this evening's webinar um, in, in case you keep CPD records or, or you know, want to, to show that you're doing additional learning. Um, so, we'll, um, so you can download those two at any point during this evening's webinar, but we'll also leave a couple of minutes at the end um, to give you time to download those also. Um, and finally, there will be a short survey at the end of the webinar. So if you're able to spend um, a minute or so just completing it to let us know how we got on, that would be great so that we can um, make sure that we're doing presentations which you guys want to see. Um, so now I'll hand you over to Dave and Paul. And just to warn you, there will be a couple of polls in the presentation for some audience interaction. So uh, to keep an eye out. Anyway, here you are. Hello there, I'm Paul Markham, I'm the Senior Training Lecturer at Mansfield. And I'm David Scully, the Regional Inspections Manager for the North. Uh, we're going to do an earthing and bonding presentation. Uh, just to let you know that there's the two books on, on the screen are obviously BS7671, everybody's uh, familiar with that. Uh, but the one uh, on the right hand side there is uh, the IET Guidance Note 8, which a lot of the information is within. Right, so earthing then, so what is the purpose of earthing? Earth, essentially it is a means to align, to allow line to earth fault current to flow through a system at such a level so as to operate the protective device within the permitted disconnection time. Uh, totally different to bonding, because bonding is there to reduce the touch voltages between exposed extraneous conductive parts and earth. Uh, when a line to earth fault is present. Uh, a lot of these uh, terminology references will be made clearer as we go through. Right, so terminology then, so um, these can be found within BS7671 in part two of definitions. So earthing conductor, so an earthing conductor conductor connecting the main earthing terminal of the installation the means of earthing for the installation, i.e. earth electrode or the distrib distributor's earthing system. A circuit protective con conductor is a conductor connecting exposed conductive parts of equipment to the, earthing, to the main earthing terminal and provided to all class 2 equipment. So main pro protective bonding conductor is a conductor connecting extraneous conductive parts, extraneous conductive parts to exposed conductive parts, and exposed conductive parts to earth. And these are all via the uh, MET. Uh, two more terminology references. Um, difference between exposed conductive parts and extraneous conductive parts. A conductive part that is of the equipment that can be touched and is not normally live but which can become live under fault conditions such as the, the outside of a metal kettle, the, the front of a storage heater, a, a class 1 metal light fitting is an exposed conductive part. These are all parts of the electrical system that could become live under fault conditions. An extraneous conductive part is a, a part that normally introduces a potential that is generally F potential, zero volts, not forming part of the electrical installation. These are examples such as water pipes, gas pipes, etc. 
So the requirements for fault protection, so protective earthen regulation 411.3.1.1 states exposed conductive parts shall be connected to a protective conductor for each type of system earthing. Simultaneously accessible exposed conductive parts shall be connected to the same earthing system and a CPC installed to protect against dangers that may arise from contact with exposed conductive parts during a fault. That's earthing. Bonding is also important. In connection with the fault protection mentioned, the, the application of the method of protective potential bonding is one of the important principles for safety. So, Protective Equipotential Bonding Regulation 411.3.1.2 So, in each installation, main protective bonding conductors shall connect to the main earthing terminal extraneous conductive parts including the following Water installation pipes Gas installation pipes uh, other installation pipe work and ducting, central heating and air conditioning systems, and exposed metallic structural parts of the building. Uh, this slide is really uh, a little build up of those terminologies that we've just been going through. Uh, the earth obviously is, is the general mass of earth that we sit on. Uh, it is a part of the electrical system uh, and as such um, is what we connect all our earthing systems to. Uh, as you can see at the bottom there, it does mention uh, the, the terminology 2BS7671 part 2 on page 37 that Dave referenced earlier. Uh, just popped up is, is what we have is the main earthing terminal uh, and connected to the main earthing terminal you will have your earthing conductor. This earthing conductor then uh, goes to the, to the point of earth the either the TNS system, TNCS system provided by the, the distributor or the, the earth electrode for a TT system. Uh, also now we have the extraneous conductive parts shown, steel work within the ground, uh, water pipes, gas pipes entering the building uh, and these all need to be protected bonded back to the main earthing terminal. What we have here is the, the class one equipment, the, the metal exposed conductive parts. We've got a metal light fitting, we have a bit of steel trunking uh, and they would need a CPC connecting each one of those from the main earthing terminal to, to those points. Uh, and last but not least we have the, the supplementary bonding conductors, uh, commonly called cross bonding, uh, but again put in place as a supplemental, that's why the word's there. To make sure that the, the potential of all of these pieces of equipment don't rise above the, the zero volts of Earth. So, in the diagram you can see on the screen now, we have uh, it demonstrates a TNS system and methods for bonding and earthing. Now, on a TNS system, it's obviously identifiable as the uh, main Earth comes off the uh, sheath from the incoming cable. Uh, and this one is, is the modern day PME system, TNCS system, uh, where the, the supply neutral uh, becomes the, the earth at the service cutout. You can see that the earthing conductor is in the neutral block at the service cutout head. Um, this should only be performed by, by the DNO. Uh, there may be a charge, but that, that would be upon the DNO to decide whether there was a charge for connecting to a PME system. Uh, and PME is always advisable to look for the labels on the, the service cutouts that state there is a PME available. And the final earthing system then, so this is a TT system, which again would be identifiable via the earth spike. Now, TT systems you, you'll more commonly come into contact with in agricultural uh, installations or more rural locations. Uh, back to the protective equipotential bonding regs. Um, 411.3.1.2 uh, states that um, everything should be bonded. Later on in, the, in BS7671 
chapter 54 refers to, to earthing and bonding. Uh, and one of the regulations in there states that uh, a protective equitential bonding conduct shall be made as near as practicable to the point of entry of the service into the premises. And wherever practicable, the, uh, the connection shall be within 600 millimeters of the, the stop cop, gas meter, whatever. Okay, so when bonding your gas and water, you should be using the BS951 clamps and labels. Now, th these labels essentially say safety electrical connection, do not remove. Uh, you may choose to bond your gas and water separately, or alternatively, you could use one conductor, so long as this conductor is continuous, i.e. you don't get to the water, cut it, then go to the gas. Again, a requirement for fault protection. Uh, in electrical installations, the risk of injury may result from shock currents. Uh, one of the fundamental principles of the regulations is to make sure that shock currents do not uh, result in somebody's injury. And the way that is done is, is to prevent the current passing through the body totally, uh, to limit the magnitude of that current passing through the body, uh, and then also to limit the duration of the current passing through the body, obviously done by making sure that the, the protective device operates within a required time. <clears throat> okay, so responsibility for earthing and bonding. So, with regards to earthing, uh, it's an electrician's work and a CPC is required at all points of an installation. Bonding, again, will be electrician's work and if other trades are adding, altering or installing pipe work or additional metal metallic services or steel work, they are responsible to ensure the bonding is in place. Uh, also responsible uh, is uh, protective bonding to all extraneous conductive parts. Uh, this is traditionally done by the electrician, but any installer of meta metallic service or structures should assess the need for it to be bonded. Obviously, current passing through a body is dangerous. Uh, small amounts of current can cause damage. Uh, small amounts of current can even cause death. Uh, the equation that you can see in front of you, the, the simple equation, uh, is basically Ohm's law. As you can see, I equals V over R. The, the WTF is the total impedance of the human body. Uh, and usually for the... Um, for the purposes of, of calculations, it's, it's usually taken at a thousand ohms. This obviously will uh, be different for different people, depending on what clothes they wear, uh, what they do, how old they are, etc., etc. But a simple Ohm's law calculation of, of 230 volts divided by that that uh, thousand ohms uh, gives you a current of 230 milliamps. 230 milliamps, as you can see from the the box with the red square around it uh, states that it results in strong involuntary muscular contractions. There is a difficulty in breathing. There are disturbances to the heart function. Uh, a mobilization may occur uh, and obviously as that current increases so the effects will increase also. Now in this diagram uh, we're showing that all the um, required earthing and bonding is in place. Um, essentially, it's important to ensure this is in place so as to reduce or eliminate the differences in potential, therefore eliminating uh, risk of shock. Where does the earth come from? Uh, the earth comes from uh, the supply source. Uh, the supply authorities uh, transformer and the secondary side is, is depicted in front of you. Uh, the windings are so arranged that um, they form a, a star connection. Uh, the middle of that connection uh, is, is always zero volts. Uh, no matter what, it will always be zero volts and to keep it at zero volts 
the supply authorities install a large plate underneath the, the concrete plinth of the transformer substation and a tape from that plate is then taken and bolted to that star point. The star point being zero volts uh, is the purpose it is to prevent the potential of the live conductors with respect to earth rising to a value that could cause damage or danger. Uh, because we have a zero volts there we can also put our, our synthetic neutral in for, for single phase systems. <clears throat> okay so in the uh, diagram provided, it essentially we're showing the uh, path for earth fault loop impedance. Um, now earth fault loop impedance is essential as in it, ca it causes the operation of your protective devices within the required time. What we have here is a, a little poll for you. Uh, we're going to show you a few pictures. Uh, and as you can see from the top, what we would like you to do is, is ask or tell us whether you think it should be earthed, whether it should be bonded, or whether it is able to be left alone. Okay, so what we have in picture one is a class one metallic light switch. Great, so would you earth, bond or leave that metallic light switch that you just saw there? Give it a few more seconds to uh, give you all a chance to vote. Great, we'll close that one down. Okay, and the second image um, what we're showing is structural steel which has been installed and is at a considerable depth. Thanks Dave, so uh, based on that image would you earth, bond or leave? A few seconds. Great, we'll close that one down. Okay, and in image three, we've got a shower installation. So what we're looking at essentially here is the curtain rail and the riser rail for the shower head. So what's your decision on that one? Just give you a few more seconds to decide on that one. Great, we'll close that one down. In this picture, we have a more commercial, industrial type of boiler room. Uh, uh, and in here, we've obviously got pumps, electrical equipment, but also a lot of, of probably gas pipes, water pipes, etc. So do those water pipes, gas pipes need earthing, bonding, or do you, do you leave them alone? Okay, we've got um, nearly everybody voted now, so I'll give you a couple more seconds. We'll close that one down. This picture shows a suspended ceiling grid. Uh, the ceiling grid that you would find in, in offices, shops, places like that. Uh, the ceiling grid itself, would you earth it? Would you bond it? Or would you, you leave it be? Right, we'll close that one. So last one then. And the last one is a class 2 brass downlight. 
again, you see in lots of, of properties, domestic properties, commercial properties, the like. Uh, here we've got a, a brass um, eyeball. Uh, class two, would you worth it, bond it, or would you leave it? Great, got everyone voted there, so we'll close that one down. Uh, these uh, pictures we will see again uh, later in the presentation, uh, and we'll have a, another go through them, uh, and then we'll give you the answers to um, whether you should have earth bonded or, or left them alone. Okay, so a definition of extraneous conductive part. So even 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 with the definitions, it, it can be difficult to tell what is and what what isn't a extraneous conductive part. Uh, a way to assist in making the, this decision, the designer of an installation can analyse the definition by breaking it down into three discrete parts. Is it one? A conductive part, two, liable to introduce a potential, generally earth potential, and three, is it not forming part of the electrical installation? So, going on to a definition of an extraneous conductive part, at the top you can see some examples of fault currents. 0.5 milliamps is the threshold of perception. This is when we start to feel current flowing through our bodies. It is a very infinitesimal amount. 10 milliamps is the threshold of let go. This is when we don't want any more contact and we need to get off it because it's hurting. Uh, and 30 milliamps can cause effects dependent on the conditions. It does state no lasting effects uh, are there, but at the end of the day that will depend on what the conditions are. We have a, an equation in the centre uh, and as you can see, we've got RCP there. RCP is the measured resistance between the main earthing terminal and the metalwork you need to take into consideration. So this is the resistance being a long lead test between the MET and the piece of metalwork you are trying to assess. Uh, the next bit is simply uh, the Ohm's law calculation again in reg speak. UO is the nominal voltage to earth uh, of 230 volts, obviously. IB is the current that we don't want to exceed going through the human body. And ZT, impedance, is the total impedance of the human body. Uh, and as you can see from our diagram, we have a gentleman uh, being able to touch an exposed conductive part and a piece of metalware that we're trying to assess. If we do the equation and we take 230 volts as the nominal voltage, then we say we don't want more than a milliamp to go through our, our person uh, and give us a rough ohmic reading of 1,000 ohms for the um, resistance of the body. You can see if you do that sum, we get 22,000 ohms. Uh, uh, and Guidance Note 8 gives reference to this in the fact that if between the exposed conductive part and the metalwork under consideration is over 22,000 ohms, then the current flowing through a body would be so imperceptible that there is no requirement to bond it. Okay, so one thing to remem remember is electricity always takes the easiest path back to the neutral at the supply terminal. If the easiest path is through the CPC and bonding conductors, then that is where most of the current will flow. Uh, if an alternative path should arise, such as through a person um, to an extraneous conductive part, then that person could receive a severe shock causing injury or death. Uh, 
this is essentially why it is important not only to provide protective bonding but also to ensure the cross-sectional area is correctly sized to ensure it is large enough to take the fault current. The cross-sectional area of every protective bonding a protective conductor, sorry, not bonding conductors, except bonding conductors, shall be calculated in accordance with two regulations within Chapter 54 of the regulations. 543.1.3 is a regulation referring to the adiabatic equation, and the following equation, 0.1.4, refers to Table 54.7 in on page 166, the table that we will discuss in a while. In the blue box, you can see the adiabatic equation. All protective conductors are sized on this uh, to ensure that they will withstand fault currents uh, and therefore not melt like a fuse does before the, the fault has cleared by the protective device. S is the cross-sectional area of protective conductor required in millimeter squared. I is the fault current that will flow through the protective device when the fault occurs. T is the operating time of that protective device. Uh, this is not the maximum operating time, this is the actual operating time. Uh, and K is a factor given to uh, the protective conductor which takes into account its resistivity, the insulation properties around that material. So the prospective fault current can either be measured or calculated. Now the formula uh, in the blue box, essentially uh, I equals uh, U over ZS. It's a very uh, simple formula. So 230 volt divided by your ZS, ZS will give you your value. Now, time T is found using the time current characteristic uh, curves found in Appendix 3. The K factors can be found using tables 54.2, 54.3, 54.4, 54.5, and 54.6. These are on pages 165 to 166. And they are usually for a multi-core cable or in con conduit trunking 115. Uh, here we have you, the, the time current characteristic curves that are mentioned in Appendix 3. They, they, uh, there is a graph for every type of protective device. The, the one we're looking at at the minute with the curve is a fuse. Uh, there are graphs obviously for circuit breakers as well, but they, they have a, a backwards question mark type shape. Uh, the same, the same process is, is used for, for finding disconnection times from these graphs. Uh, it's not shown on this slide but in the top right hand corner of the graphs in Appendix 3 you, you actually find a, a chart uh, describing what the, the graph is about. Uh, current that has been calculated or measured can be measured across the bottom uh, and then when you get to the point where that current is you, you go up to the fuse in question whatever size that fuse is uh, and once it dissects the curve you can then read off the the actual disconnection time for that protective device. Uh, here we have a uh, um, an example uh, of how to work out the sizes of CPCs. Uh, here we've got an example for a single phase circuit wired in PVC copper singles cable uh, enclosed in conduit. Uh, the circuit is protected by a 20 amp uh, BS88 stroke 3 fuse uh, and the design ZS is 0.45 ohms. Again the simple equation for calculating fault current. I equals V over R essentially. U0 over ZS, put in the 230 volts nominal current. You design ZS of 0.45 and your current fault current for that circuit would be 511 amps. If you go to the graphs 
and choose a 20 amp BS88 stroke 3 fuse graph, you would see on page 3 one time, 319 of BS7671, that the time is actually below the solid line uh, and therefore it's instantaneous at 0.1 of a second. K, as David mentioned, is taken from the the K factor tables in 54 and for a bunched cable it is usually the figure of 115. All of these in the adiabatic equation 511 squared times 0.1 then you square root it only square root the top bit when you've got that answer you divide it by 115 and that equation comes out at a size of 1.40 millimeters squared and therefore you need a 1.5 CSA earthing conductor CPC. <clears throat> uh, okay so in the event that you are not using the adiabatic equation uh, you could also refer to table 54.7 <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and as we can see, the cross-sectional area of the line conductor, if it is 16 mil or below, then the protective co the protective conductor should essentially be the same. In the event you are installing a cross-sectional area for the line conductor of 16 to 35 mil. Um, Again, your protective conductor would be a 16 mil. <clears throat> In the event you're installing line conductors that are 35 mil or above, essentially you would take the cross-sectional area of that line conductor and divide it by two, so i.e. half it. In the event that uh, you are installing a line conductor where the protective conductor is not the same material such as if you was to install a steel wire steel wired armoured and use the armourings as earth or you was using conduit as a means of earthing then you would look to the formulas in this uh, final column to work out essentially what's it uh, uh, your conductor uh, special consideration needs to be given to bonding conductors, protective bonding conductors, uh, where PME systems exist. Chapter 54 uh, of the regs states that uh, where a PME exists, then the protective conductors shall have a CSA of not less than half that of the main earthing conductor, uh, and that is subject to a minimum of 6 mil squared. Uh, please note that it is the distributors' network operators who, who relatively insist on a 10 mil bond uh, for fault current levels uh, throughout the country really. If the supply is a PME then all protective conductors are selected in accordance with a table uh, table 54.8. So as Paul mentioned so here's table 54.8 which shows you the um, minimum sized minimum cross-sectional area of bonding conductors in relation to the cross-sectional area of the supply neutral. So if you were to was to have a supply neutral of 35 mil or less your bonding conductor would be a 10 mil and if you were to have a cross-sectional area of 35 mil to 50 mil on the supply neutral your bonding conductor would jump up to a 16 mil. Now, as you can see, the higher the cross-sectional area of the supply neutral, the higher the cross-sectional area of the bonding conductor that needs to be installed. Going back to a little bit of terminology uh, and the supplementary bonding conductors, I did mention that they are commonly called cross bonds, as it's easier to say. Um, these are used primarily in places where there is increased risk of shock uh, and RCDs uh, do not exist, uh, e.g. Uh, older installation bathrooms. Um, 
supplementary bonding, according to the regulations, and regulation 701.415.2 says that it should be in place. Uh, and then it sort of contradicts itself and turns around and says, may be omitted if, and there are three ifs, and they all need to be there, uh, if the main bonding is present to water, gas, oil, etc. If the pipework is of a continuous piece, uh, and if there is an RCD fitted to all circuits within the location, low voltage circuits within the location, then, then supplementary bonding isn't, as I say, required. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to revert back to the earlier poll and we're going to see how you did and see what the answers were. Great, so based on what you've just been um, told by Paul and Dave, has your opinion changed on whether they, uh, that image would be earthed, bonded or left alone? That's the image of the switch. This will come out. Give it a few more seconds to, um, to cast your votes. Still coming in. But we'll uh, we'll close that one down now. Okay, so looking at the results gained on that one, um, again, like we spoke about, a class one metallic light switch, 96% were correct in stating that that would be earthed. Okay, so picture number two, again, is the stru um, stru structural steel? Sorry, I couldn't, couldn't get my words out then. Uh, so, how how did we decide we'd get on with that one? So, the steel structure you just saw there, would you earth, bond, or leave it? A bit quicker with your voting this time, which is great. So I'll give you a couple more seconds. And close that one down. Okay, so the structural steel would actually be an extraneous conductive part, as, as discussed earlier in the presentation. So we, as 90% of you correctly said, we would bond that. Okay, and image number three was the shower installation. So we're looking at the um, riser rail and the curtain rail. So based on the information you've heard uh, recently, so would you earth bond or leave um, the riser rail and shower rail in that picture? Right, and we'll close that one down. Okay, and the results are in, and so now obviously looking at that, it's not an electric shower, nothing in the uh, vicinity, so as 94% of you have correctly said, we would leave it. Bottom of the page now, we have our our water pipes, gas pipes in a commercial industrial uh, utility room, boiler room, whatever. Uh, again, we ask the question, earth, bond or leave? Uh, so I'll hand over to Charlotte again. Here we go. So, earth, bond or leave? Question of the afternoon. extra quick voting this time so that's great I'll close that one down 
Right, close down, uh, and a large 96% of you said it would be bonded, uh, and yes, that is the correct answer. It needs bonding. Water, gas, yeah. Uh, the middle one should be interesting. The, um, the suspended ceiling grid. We asked whether that needed air thin, bonding, or whether you would leave it alone. Uh, and so I'll, I'll hand it over to you again. Okay, second to last one, earth bond or leave? Suspended ceiling. Causing a bit more um, confusion this time. Right, we'll close that one down. Yeah, definite difference of opinion here. Very good. Uh, yeah, I, I, over 50% said to leave it. And the answer is actually to leave it, yeah. It doesn't need airthing, it doesn't need bonding. Uh, it is not a support system. It's not there to, to take the weight of cables. Cables should not touch this. Uh, it would actually be indirectly earthed from the, from the metal modular light fittings that you place in the grid. Uh, but it doesn't need airthing itself. The, the, the themselves need airthing because they're exposed conductive parts. But, but the grid, no, it's not a part of the electrical system. Uh, and therefore, it does not need earthing or bonding, it should be left alone. Uh, and the last one is a class 2 brass down light. We asked you the same questions uh, and so we'll, we'll open up the file one more time, see what you come up with. There we go, so the final poll for the evening. Earth, bond or leave the down light. Great, and we'll close that one down. Uh, and again, uh, a bit more of a, a split on this one. The majority, thank goodness, uh, are A-OK -okay with 67% uh, leaving it. Yes, uh, the key there is that it is Class 2 equipment. Uh, class 2 equipment is manufactured uh, by the people that put these things together to ensure that under normal conditions there is no way the metallic uh, structure can come into contact with with the electrical uh, parts of the lamp uh, and therefore it, it needs leaving alone. Yeah. Uh, and those were the answers, yeah. Uh, okay, so as a summary then, so the installation of protective bonding is as important as ensuring that all points of the installation have a CPC, CPC terminated at each accessory. You could, you could make reference to BS 7671 chapter, chapter 54. Uh, this is important for all earthing and bonding issues. You could also reference part 7 for special installations or lo locations detailing specific requirements. Or guidance note 8 for more information. Well, I do believe the other guidance note as well, guidance notes will assist you in any earthing and bonding questions you may have. Yeah, just going on from that, yeah, obviously um, uh, uh, any special locations uh, are in, uh, need to be taken into account with the earthing and bonding issues. Uh, and of course, you've always got the, the electrical forum, make it forum, and of course you've got the, the technical helpline should you, should you ever need us. Wonderful. You'll be pleased to know, Dave and Paul, that you've got lots of questions. Um, oh, so, uh, if you'd like to show your faces, I'll read those read those out for you to uh, to tackle. Um, really engaged audience, so that's great. So, we've got a first one from um, Andrew. And apologies if um, these answers to these questions have been covered throughout the presentation as we go, um, but it's always useful to to reiterate. So. Um, when using um, 16 millimetre tails, has the size of the earth changed from 10 millimetres? Well, really you should be using 25 mil tails. Uh, I know, again, um, as long as the tails are large enough to take the, the currents that the consumer unit connected to it, uh, our uh, need, then obviously, um, to me, you should work to the on-site guide. The on-site guide 
in a domestic dwelling is sort of a belt and braces uh, situation whereas if you put 25 mil tails in and a 16 mil earthing conductor there will never ever be any comebacks at all and um, over the top it may be yes but uh, there's going to be no problems that you will envisage in the future anything less than a 16 mil main earthing conductor uh, and anything less than 25 mil tails then you're guaranteeing by the signing of the certificate that you're happy with that installation uh, and nothing will happen Okay, thank you. So um, we've got one from Lucian who's asking, um, does an, a, a lightning conductor need testing for continuity during an EICR? I'm not sure whether that's off topic or not, but um, one for you to... Do you want to? I don't. Light, lightning oh. conductors actually come under a different British standard. Uh, uh, whether they actually need bonding now, or, or not, uh, the older regulations said that they should be bonded back to the main earthing terminal. Uh, what the regulations now state is, is that the, the designer of the lightning conductor system needs to be consulted as to whether it needs bonding. So somewhere along the line, the person who put the, the lightning conductor in should be, should be asked, does it need bonding? Uh, if it's an existing installation and it's bonded already, then, then that is the answer. Uh, as far as uh, continuity goes, uh, it doesn't come under BS7671 as I said, so really it's not a part of an EICR or even an initial verification. Thanks for that one. So um, we've got a question from Wayne who's asking, if the ZE is low, can you add an extra earth rod to the TNS system? Um, interesting. It'll work. <laughs> <laughs> Parallel paths always work. But if you've got a, a, a low ZE, ZS, then, then why need to, to install another uh, rod? Um, you're just installing a rod for, for no reason. No, really. I suppose in the event that the ZE is high, you could install a rod make a TT system to inform the supply authority that way you're covering all angles I'm guessing that's maybe where the question was going um, but yeah notify the supply authority that they'll come out at some point if required but until that time you could knock an earth right in to uh, meet requirements Great, so um, Kevin's asking, um, it's relatively easy to correctly bond new properties, but trying to improve old but nicely decorated houses can be a nightmare, um, e.g. 6mm uh, bond cables, water pipes and stock cocks uh, behind fitted kitchens, etc. Um, have you got any suggestions to help him out there? If you're rewiring, then you're going to have the boards up, or you're, you're going to be here, there, and everywhere anyway. So in that case, really, there is no problem because you're you're taking cables all over the place, so you'll take the bonds. Don't forget the bonding can be done as near as practicable to the entry of the service into the building. So as, as long as you can prove that the um, uh, that the the pipe work is continuous using a, a wandering lead method two test uh, to check for continuity wherever you bond it could be noted on your your paperwork your, your certification uh, uh, and stating why it was bonded there and the need it was bonded there uh, yes things are difficult uh, I do apologize but the regs don't take it for help difficultness uh, they say it should be bonded uh, practically at the mains within 600 mil but wherever practical is possible and um, yeah, that's about it really. Um, the regs also state additions and alterations. Uh, and with those additions and alterations to a circuit, uh, what it states basically is that the system that you're going to expand and uh, add to has to be to be compatible. Uh, and if required, then the, the earthing system has to be adequate as well. It doesn't actually state what adequate is. Um, you would have to take into consideration whether you thought a 6 mil bond would do the job. Uh, and disconnect the protective device in the right time without any damage to that protective conductor. Yeah, just just uh, going on from what you said with the wandering earth lead test, what what you'd be sort of be looking for as a value is you'd be looking for below 0 0.05 uh, 
for your reading and that'll tell you you've got an adequate earth but again if you was doing an EICR and you was questioning the size of the bonding if you've got a six mil there is it immediately dangerous or does it just not comply so you'd see through it so it's not there's a lot of things to take into consideration really Thank you both. So we've got a question that's um, come up a couple of times from both Daniel and Andrew and it's about um, can you shed some light on the main protective bonding of plastic, gas and water pipes into domestic installations so specifically uh, new builds um, are experiencing this at the moment. So the one I'm doing at the moment is fed via a plastic pipe which then continues in plastic pipe work for a large proportion of the property. After you or after me? <laughs> plastic pipe obviously doesn't need bonding. Um, you won't get plastic gas um, one day probably, but not at this present moment in time. It will either be screwed uh, steel or it'll be, it'll be copper. So, so gas is usually uh, needed to be bonded most definitely. Uh, plastic throughout the system uh, doesn't need bonding in any way shape or size because obviously it's an insulated material and, and can't become live. If there are sections that are, are metal then the, the PowerPoint uh, showed how you can determine whether it is a, an extraneous conductive part or not. Thank you. So we've got one from Darren who's asking, um, is a six millimetre bond sufficient if carrying out minor work i.e. adding a socket to an existing circuit or does it need upgrading to 10 mil? <laughs> adequate. Yeah. I'm sorry but I'll have to use adequate and I do apologise but I'm just going to look at it in the regulations. It's 134 I believe. No it's not. I knew it was not. It's 132.16 uh, and when it states in the regulations additions and alterations it is no addition or alteration, temporary or permanent, shall be made to an existing installation as unless it has been ascertained and the condition of any existing equipment, including that of the distributor, will be adequate for the altered circumstances. Then it goes on to say, furthermore, the earthing and bonding arrangements shall be adequate. Now, adequate is not defined in the regs, I do apologise, but it's not. Uh, six mil, if you're getting decent ZSs, if the protective devices will operate in the required times, six mil to me would go down with a comment on my minor work certificate. Anything else for that? No, I think pretty much covered it, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Paul. So um, we've got a question about one of the poles, who, um, and they're asking what would be the case, um, earth bond or leave, if the shower that we saw was electric? The shower would be earthed. Yeah, that's right. It would have a CPC to it. Yeah. yeah. So that's it done. Yeah. But the, sh the the curtain rails, there would still be no need to earth or bond it. Yeah. Great, thank you. So um, another one, and excuse if I don't pronounce this right, but can the adi adi adiabatic equation be used to calculate bonding size? Not bonding size, no. It's protective conductors, but protective bonding conductors should be sized to the requirements of a, of a TNS system or a PME system. Great. So we've got one from Dylan here. What is the name and minimum size of the conductor between a flush metal back box earthed via a CPC and metal light switch? CPC is 1.0. It'll just be a flying lead. Yeah, it's 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 an earthing conductor. It's a it's a CPC. It's a continuation of a CPC. That's all. Mm. Great. So Mick's got a question. Where do we stand with cross bonding metallic pipe work, where the plumbers have used plastic elbows? That 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 needs reinstating. Yeah. If if a plumber puts a plastic T piece in. An insert, uh, then they they should bond across the two bits of metallic mm. metalwork to keep the bond in place. Yeah. Great. 
Great. So um, going back to those polls again, uh, we've got one from Michael asking, can you advise what is the recommendation for a suspended floor such as that you'd find in a computer room? It's the same as a suspended ceiling, yeah. It shouldn't. It doesn't need to be to be earthed or bonded. If you've got electrical equipment and electrical ducting and trunking going underneath the floor, then obviously that will be earthed, uh, and it will earth the floor automatically. But the floor itself doesn't need to be bonded. Now. Great. So we've just got a couple more. Uh, one from Neil, who's asking, on a central heating system. Some of the time the plumbers use copper tails through the walls for taps or for radiators. Where does this come in in requirement for bonding? If there is no bond on the water due to it being plastic and the boiler pipe work is all plastic? Question mark. Did pipes go through the wall? It's no, no, no requirement. No requirement. It's not. It's. It's not an exposed conductive part, it's not an extraneous conductive part, and it's got no chance of becoming live and therefore doesn't need bonding now. Okay, so final one we've got from Daniel. What would be your action if you changed a consumer unit in a block of flats which was fed in 16mm T and E with a 6mm CPC fed from a a BS 136160 type 2 fuse. A note on the certificate mentioning this question mark, and apologies if that's too uh, complicated to answer, guys. Sounds to me like the earthing conductor, or the main earthing conductor, won't be the right size. So, um, uh, again, it, it needs an assessment, a risk assessment, onto whether that the CPC within the the, the 16 mil twin and earth would be big enough for a start. It, it probably wouldn't. Uh, it probably wouldn't be big enough either for the bonding being connected to it at the the earthing terminal within the, the new consumer unit. Um, so the tails would probably need to be upgraded. It will also depend on how they're installed as well, whether they require ACDs at both ends and giving you discrimination problems. So, so it can be a bit of a nightmare job that one. Great, and I did say last question, but we've got one final one for you, I promise, because you've got two minutes left. So um, this is from Vernon. He's asking, does the main bonding cable have to be terminated at the MET, or can it also be terminated within the consumer unit? Yeah. Either. Yeah, does it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Usually take them back to the, to the consumer unit, because that's where all your cables are going anyway. Uh, but it doesn't have to. It can go to the to the main earthing terminal in the outside cabin, or the main earthing terminal on the on the um, meter board, whatever. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for um, for answering all those questions, everyone, and thank you everyone for taking the time to join us this evening. Um, as I said, we'll keep the webinar on for a couple of minutes so that you can uh, get the handout. And if you've got any further questions, um, then put them on the survey and we'll try our best to get back to you. And this webinar is available to watch again um, and it will be up on our YouTube channel. Um, so uh, it's bye from me. Uh, yes, goodbye from us. Yeah, and bye from us, yeah. <laughs> Cheers now. Cheers, thank you.